It is Thursday on cliffcentral.com. It is the, the burning platform, which is, of course, brought to you by Nando's every week. It's your chance to get on board with all the hot issues and the hot button issues and the uh, spicy, what is it, Mozambican piri piri version. Of is it back? Stories. Mm, 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 mm. Some great flavor this morning. Uh, Pumi is here. Un- unfortunately, Canton is on dad duty this morning, so he's dropping kids at school. But you know that ha- that happens from time to time. At least we know he's busy paying attention. Mm. And I wonder, with his Movember going on, it's probably a, a great relief that we don't uh, we don't have <laughs> Canton this morning, looking like a squat pan. Um, Herman's not sparing us, though. Herman's also. No, Herman. You've got the, the cash. You've got it going on, Herman. What's happening there? Have you got a Movember, or is that just what you have all year? No, I, I must say this is just a desperate attempt at something like personality from my side, to be completely honest. <laughs> well, we'll soon. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, but we'll soon see about that. You don't that. have to agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> so Herman Pretorius is the IRR's deputy head of policy research. He has something that um, he'd like to make us aware of this morning. And something that I think is worth discussing on the burning platform. How much should we be worried about secret negotiations taking place between corporate South Africa and the government? And how are these conversations affecting your money? Now, he wrote about this in a piece that's called Selling Out South Africans in a Grubby Little Stitch Up. And he's here to talk about that today. Pums, you have been outspoken not only about government corruption and government malfeasance, but you've also alerted us time after time to how much of this goes in on in the corporate sector. You know, the one hand washes the other. So when there is corporate South Africa and there's government and they're in the same room, you better believe they are plotting against the people. <laughs> I don't know if they're plotting against the people. <laughs> I don't know if they're plotting against the people, but they, they certainly are about self-interest. Yeah. Well, Herman, give us the the, the top line uh, discussion points from your article because many people might not have yet read it and uh, they might want to go and look it up and look into some detail there. But give us the the basics here. I think this is interesting. Yeah, no, cool. Um, And thanks for having me on, Gareth. Last time I was here, I I thought I had a brilliant joke about Nando's not being chicken and I didn't prepare a joke this time, so I think I'll just wing it. You know, I... uh, 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 This is going to be a long day. <laughs> yes, we're going to start getting you back just to tell lame jokes at the beginning. But at least, at least we know you're not always serious in your role at the IRR. So tell us, though, seriously about your yep. article and what you've discovered. So over the last few months, um, actually over the last, the last few years, the Institute of Race Relations has really uh, flagged and warned South Africans about this issue called prescribed assets. Now, that's a, a very jargonesque and boring way to say government will tell you what to do with your pensions and savings. They will tell you to invest it in ESCOM or an SAA. And for the last three years, the Institute really has been at the forefront of flagging this, making people aware of this. And we escalated that uh, this year with some uh, letters to corporate entities, financial entities, who um, we asked, you know, what are you going to do about this? Um, What's your stance on this? How are you going to protect your clients? And the responses we got really didn't quite gel or, or, you know, gel with the questions that we asked. Some of them were quite hysterical. And I remember asking, you know, some of my colleagues, why do you think corporate South Africa is responding so or, you know, overreacting to this. I mean, Martha Virzitska of Signia Asset Management said we blackmailed her uh, purely for asking uh, what her uh, company's position on prescribed assets is. And then a month later, Leon Comfer, the CEO of CISA, the um, Association for Savings and Investments in South Africa, um, mm-hmm. accused us of stirring up panic. Um, and this all struck us as slightly out of sync with, with you know, merely asking questions. Let me let me understand just that before we get into any more detail. So, in other words, corporate South Africa, and particularly the people who are responsible for investing our savings, that the hard-earned money that people have put away so that they don't end up impoverished when they're old. And this is everybody from school teachers and nurses right the way up to people who've had lives where they've been working very hard for either themselves or for someone else. And they've been trying to put away some money so that they can retire in, in 
relative comfort and happiness. These people who are charged with the job of improving the value of that money by investing carefully yeah. and investing hopefully in, a, in, a, in an asset that will grow in value, those people are not nearly as worried as everybody else seems to be about the fact that some of these decisions clearly will lead to those pensions and those savings being put into assets which we know will not improve in value and which have uh, got government's dirty hands all over them. Is is that a good summation or or am so I, I missing? Canton was, I do wish Canton was here because this is the thing that Canton's always talking about. Even last week he said, oh, you know, so bailouts. But they haven't got everything yet. They do still have our pensions. Um, but I think that the, the thing to, to always know, right, is the PIC, which is Africa's largest, largest, basically, investment company, is made up of pension funds. Right. And we know what's happened at the PIC. But what this thing is, and, and Herman, um, if you can uh, give us a little bit, also for our listeners, a little bit more insights into what this, this is different from what is at the PIC. This is saying to the people like Alan Gray and all other private uh, administrators of pensions. So when you buy an old mutual uh, policy for your retirement, what those guys do with that money is they put it into different um money managers and they and now what is being this prescribed asset is it saying of that money part of it must be used on a particular set of assets that the government is going to gazette so they and and at the moment and i don't know if they they've come to a decision about um what the percentages are mm. herman do they, have mm. they got those well, uh, not quite yet, because up until now, um, they've been denying that these negotiations have been taking place. Um, so I must say it was quite an interesting revelation last week when uh, Dr. Ramakopa, uh, you know, economic advisor to the presidency, came out and said, um, government has been in negotiations for a few months now with uh, private uh, financial sector companies and banks the very banks that the Institute of Race Relations have been, has been engaging with over these last few months, all of them telling us prescribed assets is not on the table, prescribed assets is not on the table, for us only now to find out that they themselves put it on the table. Um, and so, so the, the percentages, the exact details of the you know, asset allocation and the prescription allocations, we don't know yet, but what we do know is that these private companies have been in negotiations with government for months. And then when we found out about this last week, we sent them, uh, I, I sent them a second uh, letter and I asked them six questions. One, have you been party to these negotiations? Two, have you been knowingly represented in these negotiations? Three, were your clients informed about your participation in these negotiations? Four, what steps are you taking to safeguard the assets of your clients um, against uh, the government using those assets to, to fund government expenditure? Five, in light of vast government corruption, the lack of progress in prosecuting people involved in state capture and the reality that the structure of state capture remains in place, how do you as a financial entity address the concern that these assets and resources made available to government risk being used to fund political patronage networks in a second wave of state capture. And then lastly, should the pensions and savings of your clients be made available to government, what considerations have been given to liability in terms of consequences of unsound investment decisions? And we've received one reply, and I wish to... I, I want you to one reply. Only one reply. Only one reply from Standard Bank, and I want to read you that reply in full. Don't worry, it won't take long. I refer to the letter above. We have considered your request and will not be providing comments. Kind regards, Lungisa Fuzile, CEO of Standard Bank. Hang on, I, I just missed the last bit. We will not be replying to your letter and then just kind regards. Uh, Lungisa Fuzile, CEO of Standard Bank. So they're just ignoring you. And, and really, 
you're not asking this because the IRR's money is being invested here. You're asking this because every other South African who's got a pension is p- p- perhaps implicated in, in whatever decisions are made. You, yeah, you're and, you, none of them will answer you. Yes, and, and, but, and, and it's not as if it's difficult questions to answer. It's can, essentially, all these questions boil down to one question. Can your clients trust you? And they yes. cannot give an answer. Well, that should worry all of us. Um, I mean, before we jump to the obvious conclusion to, the, to that response, which is how the hell do you get your money out of their grubby little hands? It's worth mentioning the fact that at least Standard Bank had the decency to reply to you. The rest haven't even replied. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm horrified at this. Clearly, these people have no regard for ordinary old us. You know, I think about, about how many people are dependent on that pension when they retire one day. And, and, and now more than ever, when there's so much uncertainty and you've spent years and years and years saving up, trying to do the right thing. You know, these ads that these investment companies put on TV all the time of like some dude with a post office account and every month he puts, you know, 10 rand away for his grandchildren. And then eventually when he dies, the grandchildren get this nice lump sum. And you think, wow, that's a beautiful story. Those are people who are responsible. They're doing the right thing, making sure that they've provided for their family when they go. All of that's obviously made a mockery of by the fact that these institutions will not give answers to simple questions. They're just not prepared to even countenance it. They're so important and they're so uh, full of themselves that they won't even answer your questions. And you know what, Gareth? It's been it's been a year of of engagement uh, with corporate South Africa, uh, for me personally from the Institute of Race Relations side, on three issues. In January and February, we had a campaign where we wrote to the banks and asked them if one of your clients has property where they still owe you money on that property and that property is expropriated by government, will you as the bank expect them to pay off debt on property that had been expropriated? And they to said a yes. Man, to a man, they said yes. So that was the first kind of what the hell moment that I had with corporate South Africa. Then we have the travesty of big agriculture business, Agbiz, Agri SA, countenancing the possibility of going to government and saying to government, you know, you want expropriation without compensation. We as um, big agriculture want to remain in existence. So how about we negotiate that you expropriate the farmers on family and medium and small scale farms, but you leave the commercial farms alone so that we can provide food security and you can get your political win. Um, it's only due to my colleague Gabriel Krauser that Agri SA did not go for that, and there were some leadership changes because of the expose that that Gabriel wrote. Then we move on to the NHI, where medical aid scheme after medical aid scheme just refuses to come out against this nationalisation of healthcare. And then we have this latest travesty, where for months we contact these people asking them straightforward questions then we find out they've been in negotiations with government of which they did not tell their clients on three on the three core manifestations of expropriation without compensation corporate south africa is in lockstep with the government and you know the 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 parallels to what happened to the mining sector 10 15 years ago is incredibly worrying when we warned um, these uh, the mining South Africa corporates, you know, they are coming for the mineral rights. The argument or the answer was, well, let them have the mineral rights. They will still need us. You know, there was this idea that if you can have a seat at the table, you can negotiate an ideologue into pragmatism. And corporate South Africa is now making that very same mistake. And it has decimated our mining industry. And, and I must say, as you say, these are the companies no. that spend millions of trust. Can we, can we, can we disagree. Trust. Go ahead, Pums. No, <clears throat> Herman, I, I do think, though, that, that it's just ingenious to say that the, the mining and the, the mineral rights is what decimated the mining industry. It's the price of metal that decimated the industry. It is the price of metal, you know, the, the price of platinum, the fact that people were stockpiling the, the metal, the price of gold plummeting, 
And those are the primary, um, those for us in South Africa, that's where our mining is. I don't think it's, it's because of mineral rights or because of beneficiation in the communities. That's not what created that situation. I, I, it's not I the think... only thing. Yes. I can, I can agree with that. It's definitely not the only thing. Your mining sector will always be susceptible to global commodity circumstances. But if you look at the mining charter and the undermining of mineral rights, it has had a massive impact on productivity and mining investment. Now, is it the only I, factor no. in that regard? No, it probably isn't, but it is but, definitely and, part. But because of beneficiation, Currently, if you look at stats from Stats SA, right, if you look at what's happening in the Rustenburg area, because of the local beneficiation, Rustenburg is the fastest growing economic municipality in South Africa, year on year. And that's because of the beneficiation. That's because of the fact that in order to keep your license, the mining companies are expected, are expected to work with those communities, to work within those communities, mm -hmm. to help uplift those communities. And so there's been an upswing. True. Yes, no, I must say that there are, of course, some positive developments in communities no longer being exploited. But for me, there's no getting away from the fact that investment in mining has suffered, and you can trace it to the implementation of things like the mining charter and the mineral rights decisions. But, but it is not the only thing. By I'm not saying it's admission, the only but yes, by I'm not saying admission, it's it's All a right. global yes. how about, how about this? Here's a question from Bev for you, Herman. Uh, there is some thought that making pensions available for infrastructure projects, et cetera, will raise employment levels and therefore <sighs> reduce poverty. How would you shoot holes in that idea? Well, I think that um, as long as the, the problem with prescribed assets is the prescription part. If government is going to tell you where to invest, that means that there was some reason in the first place that asset managers weren't investing in a specific destination. I have no problem with pension funds investing in decent government projects. The problem is we don't have those. We have SAA, we have ESCOM, and now we have the travesty of SABC. If government could manage government projects that actually merit consideration by investors, that would be fine. The moment they start talking about prescribed assets, you know that is not the case. If you have to tell someone to volunteer no. your money. It's not necessarily, it does not, it, it does not necessarily follow that, that well, we can I, say, what we can say is we can look at past behavior and say this is problematic. However, I think, you know, I, I think there are a couple of things for me. The fact that um, big business, the fact that the asset managers are in the room and they're having the conversation, there is still an opportunity within which to massage how this thing works out, how the, the cookie crumbles, as it were. There is an opportunity. And and I think that it is also, it's it's possibly too early to tell where this thing is going and and how it's going down. Right, because there is still an opportunity for for me as an individual putting my money in for the same reason that I can decide to put my money with Alan Gray, or I can decide to put my money with Mahda. Right, there is still an opportunity to make a decision. I mean, I mean that's 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 absolutely your right to think that. I just think that's terribly naive, and I think it's the useful foolery from corporate South Africa that has seen us reach this point. I spoke to two people from a Venezuelan think tank last uh, last week, and the parallels uh, between the destruction of property rights there and the destruction of property rights here really is upsetting, and the behaviour of corporate similarly. I, I think that both of you have very valid points here, but my, my concern is that ordinary people ought to be asking the same questions that Herman was asking in that letter that he sent to all of these different firms. If you have investments, you should be asking the same questions of whoever you're investing your money with, and you should put them under pressure to answer you or else you should take your money out and find other places to invest. There is no way in the world that you are able to to, to just as an investment business, ride roughshod over the interests of your clients because you're cozying up the government, even if you think it's a good idea, Pums. And there may, be, there may be a case for some of these investments to be a good idea. Who knows? But I don't see it. And, and if, if it was my money, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I've got, you know. I've got a small amount of money that I've saved away. But it, it, if that money isn't under my control, 
or under control of people who I trust, I'm going to be very nervous. Gareth, I think if we were to do a dipstick right now with all of the people that are listening that have some kind of pension fund mm. in place, the pension scheme and RA, any one yeah. of those things, right? If we mm. were to do a dipstick to say your RA currently that's being managed by whoever, Liberty, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who is it invested with? What projects is it part Most of? Most people wouldn't know. Most people won't know. Because when you buy into into those things, you buy into a particular in, into a particular frame. You buy right. into a frame that says at age sixty five, this is what I will get out of it, and and they they are allowed to do with that money what they want, as long as they can guarantee you a minimum amount that comes out of it. So and what you, you do you think what Herman's asking then is a bit of a um, you know a a a, a, a storm in a teacup. Look, I think the questions are valid. I think the questions are valid. And I think that with, ta and, and because what we never want to do is we never want to find ourselves in a situation where decisions are being made for us mm. and about us without us. Yeah. It's a, the, the work of think tanks, the work of people like the IRR will forever be work that, that we, that we as a society will benefit from. I think those questions are important right. questions. And I think that they, they help the people keep their, you know, keep their service providers accountable. But I do think that we cannot just make blanket statements about stuff that we don't have enough information on. We don't have enough information. I, I think, Gareth, can I just quickly quote Inoff Godengwana, who is the head of AZ Economic Policy. Yes. And we are saying, well, the resolution of conference says we must explore prescription, but prescription will only apply where there's attractive investment and people do not want to invest. So what the NC is saying here is investment will be voluntary until it isn't. And I think if you are willing to countenance the fact that government has been in negotiations with the people managing your assets, not their assets, your assets, without informing you and without being able to play open cards. I'm not making a blanket statement. I'm just saying that if you're a responsible uh, you know, individual, I would take some serious, serious thought and follow up with my asset manager as to what is going on with my assets. Yeah, but right. ANC policy is not government policy. Oh, come on. I mean, really? Are we going to go there? The ANC itself doesn't acknowledge the differentiation between party and government. Why should we? Because the ANC is not the only party in government. Oh, yes, I remember. They are joined by the wonderful South African Communist Party, aren't they? And, and the DA, and, and the EFF, and the FF, and, and you know, so in, I think in government you know, I think, or in parliament, in government you know, or in parliament. I think what I, I think what we we all like to conflate is the things that um, infuriate us about what is said in the media and what the the ANC may want to see happen, or what the EFF may want to see happen. I mean, I think about at the in, incredibly inflammatory uh, <laughs> issue of expropriation without compensation. Yeah. We have a constitution which is very clear, very clear about what it is that the government can do about the redress of land. Very clear. We have a, a, a lot of, um, <laughs> we do also have a lot of rhetoric in the media about what people can do and what people can't do and what people can expect. I think the fear that drives all of us is a fear of seeing what happened in Zimbabwe and thinking that we are going to end up there. We are going to find ourselves where people are being thrown off their land by a small group of people that are being, that, that are being allowed to do that by the governing system. But we don't have that. We have a rule of law in this country, guys. Pumi, with respect, with respect, I think you are completely misjudging what's happening here. Section 25 isn't just about land. It is expressly about all property. Hold on. If you read the sorry, you broke up there for a second. Just start that again, Herman. I'm, sorry, I'm, yes. Apologies. We kind of lost you. 
I, I, I think I think you're missing uh, the, the the issue here. Um, Pumi is firstly section 25 is not about land it is about all property quite explicitly if you read the 2020 expropriation bill the one that was published three weeks ago it is clearly not just about land but about all property the bill itself makes provision for circumstances where expropriation is not about land. So let's not conflate expropriation without compensation and land reform. Those are two different issues, and I think we play the ANC's game if we allow those two issues to be conflated into one issue. The reality is this is a government that has run out of money. There are only five ways a government can realistically get more money. Through taxation, higher taxation, that is not an option the South African taxpayer is already under immense strain. Through international borrowing, we are going to be downgraded again to a further lower level of junk status, so that's not a possibility. We can uh, uh, make uh, uh, expenditure cuts, that's politically not feasible. The unions won't allow it. Minister Mbuweni has been promising it for two years, nothing. The only two options that remain for a government that has run out of money is printing money or grabbing assets. They have just introduced a bill to nationalize the Reserve Bank, which could make money printer go brr. And then they also have the problem of asset grabs being endorsed by Pravin Gordon, the president, and the Minister of Finance. Prescribed assets has advanced to such a level that earlier this year, Tito Mbuweni was surprised by the fact that his prescribed assets notes wasn't in his briefing docket for the budget. We have to be realistic about the fact that this is a government that has run out of money and the options are quite sinister. I, I, um, I hate putting Pumi in the position where she has to defend the government because most often she's the critic of the government. <laughs> and, and, and you, you kind of, you're having to fight for someone you don't necessarily represent here, Pum. So I appreciate you bringing balance to the discussion. And, and Herman, I would, I'd love to direct people to your article so that they can find out more. I mean, Carl says here, he's been listening to this, and he says, we might not know exactly where our retirement annuities are invested, but if I found out that they were invested in any government project, I'd be pissed off. Whatever government t touches turns to shit. And, and that seems to be the, the perspective a lot of people have here. Um, Raleigh says the state should never be in control of people's individual personal fiscal goings on. They should behave like any business and prove that they're capable of managing the value. Uh, Zell says uh, Pumi has some super weak arguments, but then Amy's saying, Rikus, call, calling Pumi naive isn't helpful to a discussion. The Burning Platform is a great show because it's trying to paint two sides of an argument, not just the one viewpoint. We should be smart enough to decide for ourselves what we believe. Well, that's part of the reason that we're having this discussion this morning. So um, let's move on to other things. I know that uh, Pumi is the only person in the world who's watched every episode. No. Of the <laughs> no, she is. No, one else, no one else is as gripped by this. As Listen here. Do you know that do you, do you know that last week when Queen Anna was on, when, when Queen Anna was on, yes. <laughs> YouTube started placing ads. That's how many people were watching. When YouTube starts placing ads on your channel, my man, you I mean, have got some serious traffic. It's so embarrassing. Okay, so, Herman, you, I don't know if you guys are watching this at the IRR. I don't know if you've got any point of view on the Zonda Commission. Of course, the big talking point this week is that um, President Jacob Zuma wants him to recuse himself. I mean, as Pumi mentioned earlier in the show, this is not a court of law. It's a commission. So there's yes. no real... There's no re real need for him to consider accusing himself. But what, Pums, can you help me understand what allegations, because I haven't watched any of this stuff. It, it makes me, it, it, it honestly makes me fall asleep. Why does Jacob Zuma want Zondo to recuse himself? What is the nature of their relationship, according to President Zuma? So the, he says they're good friends or something. Jacob Zuma, no, so, so Jacob Zuma wants... Uh, the recusal because of of an allegation of bias. Now, recusal can only happen because the, the the chairperson is biased, and you can show that the chairperson is biased. The yeah. reason why bias is a grounds for recusal is because the chairperson is supposed to make a recommendation at the end of this. He is going to write a report, as we've seen with Suriti, as we've seen with many judges and many commissions before. 
he's going to write a report mm. on on all of this once he's applied himself to to everything and jacob zuma is saying that judge zondo cannot be the person because he believes this this entire commission was created to find him jacob zuma as the center of this <laughs> state capture and 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 find him guilty and deliver him basically deliver him for some kind of criminal proceedings <laughs> because he is he he was the sole orchestrator and the mastermind behind the state and he doesn't be, so that is his first problem and he also does not believe that judge zordo can be unbiased because he says they have a personal relationship between hmm. the two of them. Hmm. Now this has been the back and forth this whole week, right? Has been Judge Zondo coming out to say, "Listen, I don't have a personal relationship with this guy. He's never even been to my house." <laughs> right? So Herman, what, what, do you, what do you get? What do you get from the soap opera that uh, that I'm not getting? Well, um, firstly, I, I just want to to say to um, uh, I, I would I would gladly be called naive by Pumi. When when I call someone naive, I, I, I really don't don't mean it as a shutdown of argumentation. And I do apologize if it came across that way. So Pumi, I apologize. I I I, I think um, uh, that comment you might have some no. to worry about. Our Pumi, she's got uh, thick skin and she's heard worse. Trust me. Excellent. No, I must say, if someone were to call me naive, it'll be the nicest thing they've ever said about me. But um, on, on, about the Zondo Commission, you call it a soap opera. And I, and I, you know, the sad thing is, Gareth, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I, we watch, I, I try to watch this, but the problem is, it really is just another talking shop. There's, as, as, as Pumi pointed out, this isn't a court of law where you can be found guilty or not guilty. This isn't a process of any real significance. I think it is an expensive propaganda tool for the government to lance a boil um, of corruption and to look like it's doing something. But I must say, let's let's be fair to no, Zuma, the person who gets um, he he gets no amount of of um, let's just call it um, fairness out of the, the media, especially a media that rallied so hard behind Cyril Ramaphosa when he became president. Let's just give credit where it's due. The ANC is trying to scapegoat Zuma to some degree, because if they, oh, can, if they can do that, they can say, well, look, we're all the good guys, and he had all the bad guys, and therefore he must be blamed, and then we will... We, it's like a confession, and he will be the sacrificial lamb. I mean, that's something worth taking consideration of. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I think because it is a superficial blame game, I don't really think it is has much consequence. The problem is that the ANC created or, or you know, the, the anti-Zuma forces in the ANC created the notion over the last 10 years that what has gone wrong in this country is state capture and the Guptas, you know, only if the Guptas can be arrested, then the economy will take off again. Mm -hmm. so, so I think really... It might be the boring policy wonk speaking here, but if you want to know what's gone wrong with the country, it's policy. Corruption is a symptom of a powerful government policy um, making it possible for corruption to occur through procurement, uh, tender, uh, corruption, uh, BEE and all that. So I think if we realize that corruption isn't the problem, it is a symptom of the problem, then the Zondo Commission kind of pales into moderate irrelevance because it doesn't address any of the fundamental problems. What do you say about that, Pums? You know, the thing about commissions here in South Africa, and trust me, they will be a commission when Cyril Ramaphosa leaves, mm. and it will be about COVID-19 funds. Mm -hmm. we, we, we've we seen there was an arms deal commission. Tony Yengeni went to jail for taking a a, a discount and many other people walked away from this commission without even so much as a, a slap on the wrist and and what we've become used to is we've become used to these kind of public displays of we, we, we're doing something about it we're going to do something about it and the reality of it it's almost that, like those it's almost like those show trials um, that they used to have in Soviet Russia, but without any consequence. So it's the show trial, but only the show. 
you know? And it, yeah. it started with the TRC, started with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So mm. we're used to it. This is this is what this is what this country has become used to. We're we're used to seeing these grand gestures of we're gonna do something about it, we're gonna parade all of the bad people in front of you and we're gonna we're gonna lynch them in public. And most of them come out on the other side with, you know, relatively unscathed. One or two people may go down for this, you know. Some people's careers are going to be tarnished forever. But by and large, it's not gonna do anything. It, this is where, in my opinion, this is where an NPA, this is where a, a, a Shamila Patoi, if she really wanted to to kind of make <laughs> make a stand of some sort, this is where she does that. This is where all of this evidence should be bolstering and they should be starting cases. They should be charging people. They should be holding people out in court because the evidence is there. The commission is not going to hold anybody accountable. The commission is simply to say, here's what happened, folks. Here's what happened. These let, are the players. Let Shamila start the, the, the process. Let them let them arrest people. Arrest absolutely. people and charge them and, uh, and put them in a dock. She's been sitting around complaining about how she hasn't got resources. And she's been complaining about how she hasn't really got into the job. But it's now been, what, two years that she's mm. been sitting around there. Sitting. We have not seen one successful prosecution. We haven't even seen prosecutions, let alone successful ones. It's outrageous that we're paying the National Directorate of Public Prosecutions to sit on their hands. And it's maybe time that the, that the president puts his money where his mouth is and actually forces her to take some action. See, otherwise yeah. it is, it's, a, it's a show. And then I can understand how uh, both Herman and Pumi are getting frustrated by this process. Gareth, but I, I must say, it, it, it's perhaps the job of the Institute of Race Relations to be cynical. But it's, a, it's frustrating that we are cynical and so often right. Um, the, the, the ANC only ever gets rid of, um, a politician, uh, in a corruption scandal when that person impedes the ideological progression of the National Democratic Revolution. Um, and we, we saw that happen with Zuma. The reason they got rid of Zuma was Zuma had become a liability. They could no longer, he was a risk to their governance, so they had to get rid of him. The Ace Mogashule charade, I wouldn't really take too seriously because firstly, I don't see how Cyril Ramaphosa wins this fight that he has picked with Ace Mogashule. And secondly, the only reason they had picked that fight is Mogashule had become a liability to the ANC continuing in government. Now, my colleague, Dr. Anthea Jeffrey, really is an expert in the National Democratic Revolution and the ideological aims of the ANC. And you have to appreciate that there are no reformers left in the ANC. The ANC is now divided in the, into communists and crooks, the people who want to take your money and the people who want to steal your money. So this idea that Cyril Ramaphosa must put his money where your you know his money where his mouth is yeah. a majority of the national of the NEC are implicated in serious corruption cases the reform won't come from the ANC I'm afraid all right now, I think you know you, I think Herman you said that um it's like trying to lance a boil unfortunately I don't think it's a boil I think it's a wound and I fear the ANC might be mortally wounded I think I think the ANC is mortally wounded. I really do, um, oh, and I think that that's then, we all, then we all need to be very careful because there's nothing more dangerous than a wounded animal. Yeah, the, no, that is that is absolutely true. And and when I say it's lancing a boil, I think it is what I actually it's it's a bad way of saying. It. I think it's a PR exercise. I think the Zonda Commission is a PR exercise in the sense that the ANC knows it has a corruption perception problem, so it must at least in perception, seem to be doing something about it. I hate that term, be seen to be doing something. I just can't stand it, but it has become common political parlance and there's just no way of avoiding it. So can we, by uh, trying our best to avoid it, move our view internationally a little bit? Um, what is your feeling on the long-term ramifications or at least the nature of the relationship between ourselves and a country like Malawi where we see this Shepherd Bushiri incident, which is a very public incident. And the reason that it's very public is because 
this man has fleeced a number of, I think, probably quite poor South Africans out of their hard-earned money, just like you're saying that the prescribed assets will um, will do the same if government gets their way with corporate South Africa and they manage to bamboozle people into handing over their money. In this case, you have a preacher who, you know, you can say people who uh, who gave him money were credulous fools, but you could also say that they were naive, frankly. And I mean that in the nicest and kindest possible way. The fact is, this guy has absconded. He is not taking any responsibility for himself. Apparently, he was arrested yesterday. But the problem here is that it has evidenced to all of us, because he's, an, he's a figure of some prominence. I mean, this is happening probably every day, but we don't hear about it because most of the people who are going to and fro from Zimbabwe or Malawi or Mozambique or Namibia or Botswana or anywhere else, Lesotho, for example, we, we don't hear those stories. But this is a high-profile person, and now it has caused some diplomatic embarrassment between South Africa and Malawi. What are your outtakes, Pumi and then Herman? <laughs> you know how I feel about this ship at Bush. It's, not, it's a nonsense thing. It's, it's really nonsense. But I think more than anything is it shows how lawless our country has become. Yeah. And how inept our law enforcement is. Because mm -hmm. even when a person is on bail, even when they are expected to show up um, and, and and sign at the police station or whatever to show that they are still around and they've handed over their travel documents, all of that nonsense, right? You don't stop surveilling those people. You don't right. stop the surveillance. So for this guy and his wife to have been able to disappear, as it were, for three days without a single person knowing that this has happened is an aptitude. It really is an aptitude. And it's just... It's embarrassing. It's, I mean, it's embarrassing also, by the way, that Aaron Motswale... It's Mozzale also just irritating. It's also just irritating yeah. because on the other hand, you have a Begitele who will stand up. Yesterday, he was talking to the security cluster. will stand up and speak to the security cluster about all of these numbers, right? And they'll spend all of this um, resource chasing down things that that are of no consequence, really, that are of little or no consequence yeah. I mean, they're, the going, they're, going after, they're going after law-abiding citizens who are breaking lockdown rules but but i just want to because add those that, are the easy targets of course because those are the easy targets yeah. it's like when you're going to arrest someone for for speeding and they don't have a, a driver's license sometimes they slip through the cracks because they're not they're not following the rules already but in the case of of, of this malawi situation Arun Motswaledi said something the, the other day which again to me, reiterates the source of all this incompetence and ineffectiveness in our government. And that is that there is no individual responsibility or accountability for anyone in the governing party. Aaron Motsualedi said, this is not just my fault in home, home affairs. It is the fault of the police. It is the fault of the whole security cluster. It seems whenever anyone is caught in a tough situation in the ANC, and this goes back to Alec Irwin and ESCOM right in the beginning, which I recall him saying, we take collective responsibility, as if that's a thing. You know, if Pumi does something wrong, Becky Taylor arrests her. As Pumi Mashiko, if Herman does something wrong, you get arrested or you get fired from your job or whatever else, but there are consequences for you. In this case, Aaron Matsualedi is doing what they always do in government in this country and saying, well, yes, our department has deficiencies and blah, Did blah, blah. Cry? But everyone, no, 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 not yet, but that's still coming. That's a last resort if he runs out of options. And, and suddenly collective responsibility is the place where everyone hides again. Do you agree, Herman? Yes, sadly, I do. And, and, and the only thing I can really add to, to what Pumia has said in his analysis on this is if only, if only we had seen this level of outrage from the government when they let a war criminal slip uh, the very same fence. And I think to Omar al-Bashir, I think it was 2013. I'm not, I, I can't exactly remember the date. But for literally a war criminal, they couldn't muster this level of uh, self-awareness or apology. But let it be, you know, uh, uh, some, you know, profit. South Africa seems to lo be losing all its profits in more than one way. But the <laughs> problem here is that in the case of Mr. Bushiri, it is, I think, trivial and slightly inconsequential. 
But then we had Grace Mugabe in this country uh, on, on the receiving end of assault accusations. She was allowed to go. Mm. Omar al-Bashir, literally a war criminal, also allowed to go. And I just think it, 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 it's such a reflection on, on the perverse priorities of this government that this uh, creates a reaction, uh, but well, not any of the previous I, I things. Think it's created a reaction because the people of South Africa, they recognize this person. So he's a celebrity. Um, otherwise, it probably wouldn't have been a story anyway. Um, can we quickly, because we've got a couple of minutes left, can we quickly talk about uh, the developments, the latest developments in the US? And and I know that people have now, I, I don't know how you guys are feeling, but I'm electioned out. And I know Trump is trying his best to pick up votes here, there and everywhere by sending his lawyers out to challenge things. But oh. many people think it's a fait accompli that Joe Biden is uh, the president-elect. Of course, the actual processes still have to take place, and those will only take place in the second week of December, where the uh, the certification from each state starts to come through, and the electors themselves then cast their ballots. But in the meantime, the limbo that it has put everyone in in the United States has got both the left and the right completely insane. Uh, they've both been driven to madness in a way that, even before the the election, you could argue they weren't. Do you have any any takeaways for those of us who are trying to make sense of this? Uh, Pums, you start because I know you watch this almost as much as you watch the Zondo Commission. I I do. I am obsessed. I am obsessed with uh, Donald Trump and his tweeting. <laughs> okay, so a couple of things, right? So there is Georgia is becoming quite a pivotal state in more ways than one. I mean, it was pivotal for Joe Biden, but yeah. coming up, they are now going to have a runoff election because the next big thing is about the Senate, right? Yes, and correct. and Georgia has Georgia has that. Georgia's got a runoff election coming in January, I think the fifth or something like that. And they could decide on whether the Senate becomes a Democratic Senate or it becomes a Republican Senate. So that is also something quite like spectacular to watch, watching all of the court challenges that Donald Trump is mounting is, is also very fascinating. And, and I had a conversation with a, a colleague of mine, because as you know, we're in communications. Mm -hmm. What Donald Trump is also doing is he's taking airtime away from Joe Biden, which is one of the things that, that some of the analysts in the U US have been talking about. The fact that he is probably going to spend the next four years creating such a noise that Joe Biden's administration is always going to be fighting this, this yada, 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 yada of Donald Trump, right? But, and, yeah. and that, and, and and that is is a particularly worrying thing because they they have problems too. I mean, in the states they have some of their own problems and some big problems that they're trying to to handle and um and and get get ahead on. They, there is also some of the the administration's um, biggest challenges are going to be some of the things that Donald Trump set into motion. You know, yeah. is what Joe Biden has to come in and, and undo some of that stuff. And the biggest fear is that as he's doing all of that, Donald Trump is going to be tweeting in caps. You know, And if yeah. he does get his media company but, off the ground, he's also it, going to have a very loud voice. But it's not that just is, Donald Trump, Pums. I mean, there are 72 million people who voted for him who are not just going to disappear during a Biden administration, no matter how much Joe Biden and Kamala Harris start crying about unity and peace, which seems to be a very convenient place for them to be making noise, when for the last four years, all they've been talking about is Russian collusion and Trump's uh, evil orange Hitler, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Herman, what do you think of what's going on over there now, particularly with reference to what Pumi said about the Senate and the House? Yeah, I must say, going into this election, I was much more interested in the Senate than in the White House, because um, in more ways than one, the Senate will be determinative of the next four years in the administration. Uh, just a brief explainer, you have three centrums of power 
in the United States. You've got the House of Representatives and the Senate, which together comprise the Congress, and then you've got the White House. And if you control all three of those um, entities, both chambers of Congress and the White House, you essentially have carte blanche to do what you want. We saw that in the first two years of the Obama presidency and so on. So, um, to me, the question, it was always going to be a Democratic House of Representatives. Um, I thought it was likely to be a Democratic White House. So the question really is, does the Democratic Party control all three levers of power? And I think they will end up not doing, but as Pumi says, Georgia with its two Senate runoff elections really is the clincher. If the Democrats win both of those seats, it's a 50-50 Senate with a vice president, Kamala Harris, being the tiebreak vote in favor of the Democrats. So it's essentially then a Democratic Senate. If they, if the Republicans pick up those seats, then they retain their majority. And I think uh, Joe Biden presidency, a Republican Senate and a Democratic House will be a very good result for America. It will essentially come down to a rejection of the extremes to, in a way, a win for the moderates. Because Joe Biden, no matter what people might say of him, is an historical moderate. There's no way getting around that fact. The House of Representatives under Nancy Pelosi really pursued some radical things and lost seats in an election that they expected to gain seats. So the radicals in the Democratic House of Representatives... I mean, that doesn't mean they've learned a lesson. I mean, you yes, hear... No. You, 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 there are a lot of people in the Democratic Party who are saying, no, 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 the problem is we didn't go left enough. Yes. You know, you uh, people like Ilhan Omar who was saying the problem here is not that um, that we, we lost seats in the House because we were too radical. We we lost seats in the House because we weren't radical enough. And, and Joe Biden is too moderate in her opinion. And the AOC, mm -hmm. the squad, are the ones who are, they're the ones who are leading the charge in the Democratic Party. Not Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer. Yes, no, but I must say, Pelosi really let herself be led by the squad. And there's now within within the Democratic caucus in the House, significant unhappiness with Pelosi's decision to do that. In fact, for the first time in a while, we have significant talk of a challenge to her speakership, her leadership of that caucus. So they have perhaps not been learned less, but the, the moderates in the Democratic Party in the House have been encouraged by this election result to speak up more than they had. Donald Trump will lose this election. There's, the, I, there's no way for him to win. I, I, I thought this outcome very likely. I, I called the only state I got wrong was I called Georgia for Trump and it has gone for Biden. So the mere fact that this result is within the expected realm of possibility shows that it isn't a major fraud on the American people. And I think we see the court cases one after the other failing. But if you really want to understand what's going to go on in, uh, American politics for the next four years. Watch the Georgia Senate elections. If Donald Trump continues with this crusade he has, he will cost the Republican Party those Senate seats. If he does, then it will be thanks to him that there will be solid Democratic control at least for the next two years. If somehow the Republican Party manages to win in Georgia on those runoff elections, which they traditionally should, then I think the power couple to watch is not Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, but Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell, leader of the Republicans in the Senate, very good working relationship with Joe Biden. And let's not forget, Joe Biden is a creature of the Senate and making deals with Mitch McConnell is what he was famous for during the Obama years. Right. Sure. The... Uh... <laughs> these these circumstances couldn't be weirder actually i mean I, I you know we started this year and coronavirus is really all as predicted by many um commentators coronavirus is kind of being put on the back burner now i know that there are very serious curfews in place in new york and in los angeles and there are all kinds of rules that people like gavin newsom have you know people like that have have said that are we all fair no. Sorry, I'm just checking. No, I think we're still on. I don't know what's going on in Bulelo. Uh, just let me know that there's something wrong. Um, we, we, were, we were talking about coronavirus, and I think that even though there are all kinds of rules being applied by politicians, there are no incentives for politicians to actually make the right decision at this point because really they don't want to get into more trouble than they're already in, and they will be blamed. I mean, Pumi said earlier that there'll be a commission eventually into Cyril Ramaphosa and PPE tenders that went awry. And similarly, all over the world, politicians are looking at what's happening and going, 
as long as we can minimize and mitigate our own responsibility in the reaction to this coronavirus, that is the right decision for us. It doesn't matter what science shows. It doesn't matter what anything else uh, has to do with it. It's all down to how little blame can we get for the way that we've reacted to COVID. Do you agree? Yeah, and I must say, I think in a weird way, I do feel sorry for the politicians of our time, um, of this age. I think, um, I see Pumi, you know, being surprised by that remark, but I, I must say that it, this was a difficult year to call. Um, there was no guarantee that Sweden's call to do not to not go into lockdown, that it would have worked. And if you are a politician and not a scientist, and the scientists are, you know, giving you incredibly conflicting advice. I, I really sort of do feel sorry, but I think that, that is where civil liberties and economic prosperity then comes in. If you don't know what to do and you're a politician, I think your job is to trust the people. And if 2020 taught us anything, it is that uh, governments do not trust the people. And I think too many citizens trust the government. Hmm. All right, everybody, got to wrap it up for today. I'm afraid we're out of time. That's The Burning Platform. It's brought to you by Nando's. Thank you very much to Herman for being our special guest today.